I get this up here, that you all, the Tuesday, Thursday, 8 a.m., I'll put it up here so the other folks can see as well, that on 8 a.m., so fast. Okay, so I just want to make sure that nobody forgets it. Yeah, well, maybe you want to post up a practice. Mm, no, I don't have a practice final exam, unfortunately. Um, I, you know, it tends to emphasize topics that were hit on previous lecture exams. And I know that's not all that helpful, but probably just looking at your own, your old study guides, and if you can recall topics that were important and ended up on I know it won't be a lot of help you guys, but I think I can get this exam back to you on Tuesday or whatever we're, you know, or whatever we are. So, okay, we'll have that. Um, yes. Yes, yes, yes. Oh, and the other thing you guys, I, on a totally different topic, and I know right now you probably don't even want to think about this, but we're recruiting for volunteer micro tutors for summer and fall. So, um, if you're interested in being a micro tutor, volunteers. If you would contact me, <laughs> um, and I know you know, a lot of you might think, oh well, why is you know what what's in it for me, right? Yeah. But when we're writing letters of recommendations to professional programs or for scholarships, that being able to write in there that this student, um, you know, is dedicated to helping other people, they volunteer to be a micro tutor. You, that it's very powerful, you know, and you will find it's a very powerful experience. Teaching others is the best way to learn, and a lot of folks have said that they really like being tutors because it helped them um, remember the information they actually learned while they were teaching, and they said they thought it helped them not only in their um, entrance exams, but also helped them when they got into their professional programs. They they remembered a lot of the information that they helped tutor, so. What we usually ask is that folks have a, a, um, a grade of B or better, okay? And um, and I wanted to let you know that um, really some of our really outstanding tutors have been folks that had a hard time in the class, and they understood how hard it was to struggle with this massive amount of information. And they um, one one reason they were good tutors was that they were able to teach how they kept the panic under control how they organize the information, how the strategies they use to do well both in lecture and lab. So if you're you know, struggling in the class, don't think that you wouldn't be a good tutor. You're, you, you have a lot to offer. Yeah. Okay, so I'll be quiet there, and we'll just get to work. Uh, oh, sorry, Octavia. Yeah. Um, I know you had mentioned approximately how many questions is it on the final? Um, the final exam is probably going to be around. Like 140, 150 questions. It'll be two scantrons worth, and so it'll be. You'll, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, but yeah. So it's like all the exams, you guys. The um, you just want to get, you know, sit down and just try to get through it as quickly as possible. Don't get hung up on a hard question. Circle it and keep going. Right. Yeah. That's like two points. Um, the exam, the total exam is worth two lecture exams. Oh, okay. So the total points for the comprehensive final, it's 250 points. So what I do is I take your raw score. Each, each question on the final is worth one raw point. So let's say there's 150 questions. And I'll just, I'll just make this up, you guys. Let's say that you get um, 100 questions right out of 100. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would take, you got 100 questions right out of 150, and then I multiply it by 250 points. And then that's what goes into the grade book, is, you know, how many points out of 250 that you got. Yeah. And, and again, you guys, just, I know that it, obviously it's, it's um, very anxiety producing a comprehensive final, but I would say 80 to 90% of the folks, the grade they go into 
uh, the final with, 80 to 90 percent of people, that's exactly what they score on the final. Like if they go into the final and they have a strong B, usually they score a strong B on the final. And as an instructor, that makes me feel good. It makes me feel like the, um, the final is fair and it, and it is a good reflection of the course, the course material. Okay. Um, but, but if you're doing really well in the course, you don't want to say, eh, you know, I don't need to study because a few people, you know, they, they don't do that well on the final exam. Um, and, and, and so, of course, you don't want to, and I know none of you would do that. I just know you all are very dedicated students, but you don't want to say, eh, it's not that important because it's you know, a lot of points. Okay? All right. Um, and um, what, um, today's Thursday, right? So tomorrow, Friday, what I was going to do was set out posters that you and your colleagues have submitted that hit on topics that will be on the final exam. So it won't be any surprise, right? It's not like anybody's getting a, a um, information that nobody else knows. But I just thought it, was, uh, it would be a way um, that if you had questions on a particular topic, for example, like the nitrogen cycle, you know, we've, we've got some posters on the nitrogen cycle. If, um, if you were able to come, these would be up between 9 and 11. <coughs> Excuse me. And perhaps one of the posters, um, you remember, oh, I had trouble understanding that topic. It would just give, give us an opportunity to maybe review that topic and answer any questions you had. But it's totally optional, and people won't be getting any additional information. You know, if you can't come, I don't want you to worry about that either. Yeah, Octavia. Can I notice, okay, so would it be fair to say that the, the posters you put out are possibly going to be exam questions? Well, there would be topics on on the exam, and like I said, it won't it wouldn't be any surprise. Like if I put out a poster on bacterial cell structure, that's not a surprise, right? If if I put up like the poster over there on fermentation, that's not a surprise. Um, if we had the poster up on on antibiotic resistance, you know what I mean. They're, I mean, they're, they're, they would be big, obvious topics. So I don't want people to feel like if they can't come to the poster session, they're missing, you know, really big clues to the find. It's going to be uh, the topics would be really obvious topics. Okay, okay, you guys. So, all right. So enough, enough quacking up here. So let's let's get to it. So hopefully we can finish maybe a little bit early. Okay, so. What we're going to do today, then, is we're going to do our follow-up on Chapter 14, Control of Growth. This is Part 3. This is the Kirby Bauer Distribution Antibiotic Sensitivity Tests. And the good news is um, you'll be repeating what you did last time. And that is you're going to be measuring the diameter of the zones of inhibition. Um, so let us presume that yellow represents your lawn of bacteria. So these are your bacteria. And you guys recall that you put these commercially prepared uh, filter discs that were had been um, uh, soaked in specific antibiotics. So let's just pretend this is my um, ampicillin disc AM. All right, and you recall from the disc diffusion, um, our discussion of disc diffusion, um, the ampicillin will diffuse away from the ampicillin disc into the auger, setting up the concentration gradient. And this is so you guys know all about this. Okay. And so the further away from the disc, okay, if we excuse, I'll back up. If we were to compare the concentrations of ampicillin in the auger right under the disc to concentrations of, of auger far away from the disc, are the concentrations, excuse me, the concentrations of ampicillin going to be higher further away from the disc or lower? Lower, right? Mm -hmm. So the further away from the disc, the lower the concentration of ampicillin. We all get that, right? Okay, so what you all are going to do is you're going to use your metric rulers. You're going to measure the diameter of the zone of inhibition, right? And remember, you guys, the, um, the minimal, the MIC of the antibiotic would be found in the auger right at the border of the zone of inhibition. Okay, now that's important because it connects to the next <coughs> step we're going to do. This is something new. Because we're talking about antibiotics, we have to ask another question, and that is, can I achieve that MIC of this antibiotic in a patient? Is it physiologically possible? Is it safe? It, you know, um, can we get safe therapeutic levels of the antibiotic to match that MIC? Now, 
I mean, it's like, how the heck would we know? That would take, you know, years and years of work. So that's the beauty of the Kirby Bauer technique. They did all that work for us. They did studies comparing um, the dianrobosomes of inhibition um, with MICs, and then they did all the studies to see can you get that level of antibiotics safely in a patient. And they developed tables so that we can measure the diameter zone of inhibition and then use their tables to tell us whether we can get that level of antibiotic in a patient. Okay, so this is the new part. And this part, you guys, does, it, it's a little bit confusing for some folks. So um, what we're gonna do is in chapter 14, in my version of the lab manual, it's on page 129. This is only part of the Kirby Bauer um, interpretive chart for antibiotic sensitivity. If you see the real one, it's like pages and pages long. So what we did is we simply chose the antibiotics that we're using uh, in our lab. The only antibiotic that's missing, you guys, is clindamycin. So when we finish our discussion here, I'll put the values for clindamycin up on the board. Okay. So let's, let's just walk through how you're going to use the diameter zone of inhibition and this interpretive chart to decide whether the particular bacterium you're testing is sensitive to therapeutic levels of antibiotic you can achieve in a human patient. Okay, so how do we do this? Okay, so what we're going to do, let's pretend that we're doing, um, let's pretend that we're doing E. coli, okay, E. coli, and we've got our ampicillin disc there, okay? So let us presume that I measure my zone of inhibition, and let's say the diameter ends up being, we'll just make this up, let's say the diameter of the zone of inhibition is 25 millimeters. Now again, you guys, I don't know if I can get that level of antibiotic represented by the MIC and the auger at the border of the zone of inhibition in a patient. So I'm gonna turn to my interpretive chart and what I do is I look down the left-hand column searching for the antibiotic I'm testing. So ampicillin luckily is right off the bat. And you'll note that with some of the antibiotics, there's two different um, rows for the kind of bacteria that you're testing. So we see in our um, ampicillin, there's a row for Enterobacteriaceae and a separate row for Staphylococcus. So do you guys know which group would E. coli belong to? the Enterobacteriaceae, right? Mm -hmm. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that row, the Enterobacteriaceae. And the way I do this, you guys, is I use my ruler and I work from left to right. So I'm kind of saying over and over and over in my head, 25 millimeters, 25 millimeters, okay? So what I do is I go to the first value there in the row that says Ampicillin Enterobacteriaceae, okay? And I ask myself, is 25 millimeters less than or equal to 13? Is that correct? No, it's not, right? 25 millimeters is not less than or equal to 13 millimeters. So I keep working my way across the row. Is 25 millimeters between 14 and 16 millimeters? No, so I keep going across the way. Is 25 millimeters greater than or equal to 17 millimeters? Yes. yes. So what I do is I go straight up, and it tells me that this strain of E. coli that I'm testing is what relative to therapeutic levels of ampicillin? Susceptible. It's susceptible or sensitive. What does that mean? It will be killed at therapeutic levels of ampicillin that we, we can achieve in our patient, right? So would ampicillin be a choice um, to treat a patient that was infected with this particular strain of E. coli? Yes, yes it would be. Yeah, you, you could tell the doctor, the, the healthcare professional that ampicillin would be a decent choice. It should kill that E. coli causing the infection of the patient. Okay. Well, let's do a different one, you guys. Let's say, um, let's say we're going to do um, Staphylococcus instead. <coughs> okay, so we'll pretend this is our Staphylococcus ampicillin. So say this is our Staph epidermidis that you guys are testing. Say the zone of inhibition here when we measure it, let's say the zone of inhibition is 15 millimeters. Okay, so let's again, I know this is probably kind of boring, but just make sure we know how to do this. So 
We're still testing ampicillin, right? So which row do we go to, you guys? Enterobacteriaceae or the next row that's the Staphylococcus? Next row. Staphylococcus, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So again, we've got a zone of 15 millimeters, and I start working from left to right. So is 15 millimeters less than or equal to 28 millimeters? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I go straight up, and what do I know about this strain of Staph epidermis? Resistant. It is resistant, right? So even though there was a zone of inhibition, I cannot get that level, that MIC, in my patient, uh, probably for physiologic reasons. So what would you tell the doctor or healthcare professional that's taking care of this patient that maybe has a staph epidermidis infection of a heart valve? Would you tell them, yeah, use ampicillin, or what? what would you no, tell you can't no, use ampicillin. No, don't use it, right? Because this strain of staph epidermidis is resistant to levels um, of ampicillin that can be achieved in your patient, okay? So what happens a lot of times, you guys, is folks will pull these antibiotic plates and they'll just hold them up the light and they'll say, oh, there's a zone of inhibition. That's a good antibiotic to use in my patient. But again, remember, we have to use these interpretive charts because you might not be able to get that concentration of antibiotic in your patient, okay? All right, so do note, you guys, that with some of the antibiotics that we use, for example, uh, the penicillin, in your table it says not for gram negatives, but we tested two gram negatives. Go ahead and use the values for your E. coli and your pseudomonas, and hopefully your data will tell you why penicillin is not used on gram negatives. And likewise, if we go down there, um, it says for erythromycin. Erythromycin is not using gram negatives. Go ahead and use those values. And again, hopefully our data will tell us why erythromycin is not used on gram negatives. Okay. So what you want to do then as a team is you want to do the measurements. You want to record the diameters of zone of inhibition. And then determine for each of the microbes and each of the antibiotics, is your bacterium sensitive or resistant? And you want to record that information in your lab manual. And then what we're going to do is we're going to put up a class data table, and we're going to ask a member from each team to come up and using different color chalk, put an S for sensitive, if your bacterium was sensitive to the particular antibiotic, or put an R if they were resistant. And in some cases, you might end up with that intermediate. Just put an I for that. And that's going to help drive our class discussion, you guys. And again, I know you're so tired, but this class discussion, I think it will help not only on the quiz on Tuesday, but it's going to help you for the final exam on Thursday as well. Okay, so I'll let you guys get to work. We've got our metrics rulers up here, okay? And um, be aware, you guys, these microbes are opportunistic pathogen, and it turns out we're, I was actually dismayed yesterday, we've got some um, pretty decent antibiotic resistance. Okay, so be careful, make sure you don't open the plates, make sure you wash your hands well before you leave today, and make sure you spray down your vents, because we don't want you taking home any of these uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria, nor are there little resistance plasmids. We don't want you taking those home with you today. Okay, all right, so we'll let you get to work.